Before we start this episode, I wanted to tell you that if you're looking for free dog training courses, you can take the Victoria Stillwell Academy's most popular free course, Building Your Dog's Confidence, right now by going to vsdogtrainingacademy.com. That's vsdogtrainingacademy.com. Okay, now on with the podcast. I am so glad you're joining the podcast today because I have a guest here that you're really, really going to want to hear from. If you are concerned about dogs at all, you are going to hear, want to hear from this guy. You know him already because you've seen him. He is an extremely well-known YouTuber and has, in fact, he was, I think, and Zach, you're going to correct me when I, if I'm wrong, but like the first person on YouTube to put dog training on the map on YouTube. He was like, if you, if you, somebody came up to me the other day and she said, oh, you're a YouTuber. And I was like, what, me? I'm a YouTuber? Are you kidding? That's only for like younger people, isn't it? But it's this guy who sort of truly, as, as the his business is called, revolutionized dog training on screen. Um, his name is, you, you know, Zach George. And he is an American dog trainer, writer, and broadcast personality. But not only does he have an extremely successful YouTube show, plus all of the other social media platforms that he has, where he is literally has millions and millions of followers. He has done a whole host of training shows, in, including Superfetch in 2009 on Animal Planet and Who Let the Dogs Out?, which is a show on the BBC. So you went over to the UK mm-hmm. and then you have, is it five books, Zach? Three, uh, excuse me, two. They want me to write a third one. Okay, but. okay. Because, <laughs> or then maybe it's because they've been translated into different languages, but that you've, you've, there's a, you've written these two great books and you're continuing to give great information out there. You've also taken on The burden, I think this is a real burden, but also it's an honor, I also see it as, to be the advocate for dogs and when it comes to the way they're being trained. And you pull no punches. You tell it like it is. And because of that, sometimes that makes you a target. But what I love about you, Zach, is that you don't back down because what you are doing by advocating for the vulnerable which are our dogs, what you're doing by advocating for the vulnerable, not just in the way we raise them, but in the way we train them, is however tough and exhausting and stressful it is for you and your life from the way that some people are threatened by your message, you do it. And I just want to say, before we even start, I want to say thank you for your voice. And I am so proud that you are here on this podcast. I mean, it's an honor to be here with you, Victoria. And I would say all the same about you. Your advocacy inspires the community and it inspires people like me all the time. Um, And yeah, thank you to you too. I mean, you've been uh, relentless for, I mean, as long as I can remember for pursuing ethical dog training in the field. So I appreciate the kind words. So thank you. You, how did you get into this field and what gave you that idea? As I've always been fascinated by this, what gave you this idea to start putting this stuff on YouTube? Well, I, it was pretty intuitive YouTube at the time I, I, I entered the dog training field through dog sports. I used to do dog frisbee competitions back in the day. And right around this time is when YouTube came out, 2005, 2006. And it was just very intuitive to be like, okay, I have a handy cam camcorder. I can put that information on the internet and share what I learned. I've always been a big fan of the scientific method. And the last step of the scientific method is to share your results, learn from it. Um, and, you know, I think my audience has made me better for it, you know, over the years. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm real fortunate, but that's how I got started on YouTube. Sure. But it, it, that's not easy. And for, for somebody who has tries on social media, I was with a capital T tries on social media. Um, fortunately, the it's me or the dog folks do it. The it's me or the dog channel. So that's good. I don't have to do anything with that, but it's a lot of work because not only are you making dog training understandable, you're making it really accessible and you're making it really accessible 
to young people as well as older people. You're making it accessible across the board, but it, not everybody can do that. If you think that what Zach does is easy, I'm telling you right now, it is not. And it takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of production, and it takes a lot of energy, plus your training on TV and your training on camera, which is always its, its own beast. How do you keep reinventing and inventing and creating? Well, and, you know, when we're working with dogs, as you well know, and many of your audience will understand, every single dog is a unique experience, is is different than the last, even if subtly, sometimes they're way different. It just depends. So there's always a unique story to tell with that individual dog in the process. And I was just saying yesterday in a live I was doing on Instagram how every dog teaches me something new. And it's it's passion. Passion keeps you going. You have to really believe in something for the advocacy end to keep doing it. It's in my heart like it is in yours. And as far as the training end goes, I mean, it's an opportunity to continually build our experience and try to become better with the interest of helping more people in the future. How have you found training on camera? So, for example, when you were doing Super Fetch and then also Who Let the Dogs Out for the BBC, which was very popular. How, how mm -hmm. do you kind of keep your cool doing that? <laughs> well, mm -hmm. actually, two very different experiences there. And I know you've worked mm -hmm. with both BBC and Animal Planet US yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, we've worked with a lot of the same people over the years on on our TV stuff. Um, you know, I, I can't speak for BBC broadly. I know that when I was working there, what I loved about BBC rules was we have to tell the story that is, is here. We're not allowed to embellish or make it look like something happened that didn't happen. And I really appreciate that because that's my style. I always think the truth is good enough. We, you know, if a dog's not doing it, okay, well, let's tell that story um, and, and explain it and all of that. Whereas, you know, in the American experience, cable TV, they're not quite so, uh, <laughs> they're not quite so, I mean, at least in my experience, I can't speak for anyone else. Um, they don't, they don't adhere to that as well as I would like in general, but you know, good experiences overall. I look at my experience in TV as my film school. You know, I've been able to take a lot of those lessons learned and uh, do very abbreviated versions of them on, on myself, learning how to edit and things like that. Does it, yeah. Did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, remember. you did. Just social media is truly where it's at now. I mean, as we're moving into the social media age and belong and beyond, it really is that that's where it's at. And I have to say, podcasts are great too. So many people are listening to podcasts because we can listen to them while we're walking the dog and while we're driving our car. And, you know, it's the same with audiobooks as well. Who reads a book? And I do read it. I'm a big reader, but, you know, we, we listen to so much. So you have all of these platforms. You are, and you're very proud of this, known as a proponent of positive reinforcement dog training. Mm -hmm. So you use the gentle reward-based methods and you work, you show how it works with all kinds of different dogs, mm -hmm. all kinds of different situations. And so your proof is like you, when you say that something works, you show that it works so you have all of this data to back up why you do what you do. And now this has made you, and you've always, I know you've always been pretty outspoken, mm -hmm. but this has kind of put you on top of the pile when it comes to advocating for dogs and holding people accountable to the welfare of dogs or to welfare and dog training. What made you take that mantle? What made you do this? Because I know how stressful it is. So why would you want to put more stress on yourself by doing this? Um, like you, we are in unique positions to see how outdated dog training advice affect the masses. You know, we have, I mean, you know, we can, we get the emails, we see the videos, we see the common questions, the constant confusion. So in a nutshell, for me, it was recognizing this glaring hole in the dog training field that a very significant portion, perhaps even most dog trainers are not honoring the recommendations of the scientific consensus on the issue. In 2021, just for those that don't know, the American Veterinary Society of Animal Behavior updated their position statement uh, stating that aversive methods don't need to be used for behavior modification or in animal training and that they have side effects. And those side effects 
are unnecessary because we have alternatives available. And when I see so many dog trainers, I put out a video when it happened, Bree and I did, um, and we put out a, a video when that happened. And just to see the immediate dismissal from the aversive dog training community, not taking it seriously, um, you know, and that continues to this day. I, you know, we believe in a um, strategy of calling in and calling out. You know, we try to address individuals sometimes privately, most of the time privately on the issues to see if we can get on the same page because we think it's really misleading to the broad general public when we have influential people in the field denying uh, non-controversial scientific consensus. I say non-controversial because in the scientific behavior science community, it's not controversial at all. It seems to be mostly exclusively aversive dog trainers who want to deny the consensus that pain and fear are inappropriate in professional dog training. Why do you think this is? Why do you think with all of that? And I asked, I had, um, I have had another guest that is, is that is going to come on this podcast who, um, is, has been in this industry for 50 years and has, is, is done both sides, as it were. Mm -hmm. And, um, I, I asked him the question, like, why do you think that people with all of this information out there, this wealth of knowledge, and as the behavioral science, the cognitive science expands and, revolutionizes our understanding of dogs. Why is it that people can't get away from aversive or their beliefs in aversive at all costs? Why can they not do that? Why are they so threatened by this new way, this, which is not new at all, yeah. but, but, but why are they so threatened by it? Dr. Zazie Todd, whom I know you know, I just had a lovely mm -hmm. meeting with her as well, put out a wonderful paper on barriers to the adoption of humane dog or practices of, uh, I think I botched the title of that a little bit, but, um, and, and she really goes into a lot of that, you know, anecdotally speaking, from my perspective, it's a very multifaceted issue. The reason people train aversively, uh, ranges from simply not knowing there are better ways to scientific illiteracy, to misogyny, to toxic masculinity, um, to, uh, colonialization, uh, colo you know, colonial ways are very much rooted in punishment culture. And, uh, you know, I think there are a lot of reasons that people reject the modern scientific consensus when it comes to ethical treatment of dogs by professionals. And let me be clear, our advocacy work, while I would love everyone to use positive reinforcement, we are laser focused, particularly on personalities in the field who cater their services to up and coming dog trainers, uh, to existing dog trainers. And so we choose our battles, for lack of a better term, very carefully when it comes uh, to that. But yes, multifaceted issue. I think there are many reasons. I do think uh, I do think there is a threat from the, the the sort of the positive trading industry, and I do think there is an attempt to try and stamp out um, and minimize what we do by saying stupid things like, "Oh, you know, this only works," or "Positive only works on small dogs and puppies and issues that are just you know, like not not like things like aggression and stuff like that." Mm -hmm. That actually. You need to have aversive trainers because, or for example, if you want to rescue a dog and you've got a dog that's showing aggressive response, the only way that that dog is going to be saved is by a an aversive trainer. They say things like that. And mm -hmm. you can say till you're blue in the face and tell them that actually, no, because here's here's the reality of it. Let me show you how it's done. But they don't want to learn because they don't want to see and they just keep repeating the same old tired argument yawn yawn but it's something that does it's out there like one of these dog training myths that all dogs want to be dominant i mean it's just it's out there almost like it's the common lexicon of people now it's out there just as is it is positive trainers deal with the little dogs and the the tougher trainers deal with the tougher dogs. I mean, that's just what people think. That could not be further from the truth. Not only could it be not further be from the truth, dogs who are suffering from issues with aggression, fear, anxiety, mistrust between a person and their dog are the last dogs that need aversive methods. Those side effects I just listed to you are very well accepted in behavior science. Uh, if a dog's suffering from aggression, the last thing we want to do is validate that aggression. This is according to the experts that I routinely talk with. And I'll, I'll be honest, that aggression isn't my specialty, though I have worked with 
more dogs than I can count who have a bite history. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's a good point you bring up. Now, in your work, mm -hmm. you have taken on, um, and again, I don't really want to give people that uh, I think are abusers in the dog training industry. I don't want to say their names to give them any kind of credibility. But you have taken on particularly um, popular dog training person. I'm not even going to call him a personality because I think he's an abuser, but um, person on online, big on social media, and to the point where it he's now come out and accused you of just just insanely crazy stuff. Um, what did you see in this particular person that you felt like you had to speak out to the point where you where, where you've had to? I'm a, a little confused because <laughs> we actually do bring a lot of attention to a number of people, so I don't know exactly. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah, we're oh, talking, are you talking about from last year. Or the from big last movie? year, I'm talking about from last year. We're not talking about from okay. a while ago. We're talking about from last year because I think that is sort of you know there are trainers that come and go, but I'm talking about one who's particularly brutal on social media. That's right. Uh, and so your question is, why did I feel compelled to? Yes. Why did you take that on? Because because uh, that's not easy. Because the people that follow him, I mean, it, it's it's dangerous. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the, I mean, probably the most egregious trainer on social media. Uh, and the reason that I decided to, you know, it was controversial because, you know, like you're saying, raising awareness around an individual can help build their platform and perpetuate misinformation if we're not careful about it. But I mean, I know you, you may have been aware of him, but it, a lot of people in my community uh, had come to me, they had asked me, you know, what can we do about this? Because this is, I mean, just straight up abuse, right? That's what it is. And uh, my peers were very persuasive in compelling me. And I had wanted to for years, but really a desire to help the public not continue to be misinformed. See, there's this expectation in the public that when you hire a dog trainer, like you hire an electrician, a plumber or something else, that they're going to know what they're talking about. But those other two professions, they require licenses. Dog trainers do not. Literally anyone can call themselves a dog trainer, and they do with no experience. They don't have to be scientifically literate. They don't have to be trained in uh, proper contingencies and positive reinforcements or even punishment if there was a proper way, which I don't subscribe to. And um, I, I, my advocacy is centered around advocating for the public not to try and reform other dog trainers. This is often uh, something that isn't appreciated by our advocacy. Very often the attempt to shut us down is, you know, why aren't you being nice like to people like you are to dogs? And it just misidentifies who we advocate for. We're not advocating to reform these abusive dog trainers or even trainers who are less abusive, but still problematic. Um, we're advocating to make sure the public is well informed on the issue so that we can reduce demand for problematic dog training services. But when you see something on social media that is, I have to say, again, it looks like for mm -hmm. people who don't know exactly what's going on, mm -hmm. it looks amazing. Man versus dog. And you know what? Man wins over aggressive dog. And now dog's not aggressive anymore, which of course we know what, what's really going on. But mm -hmm. to, to the untrained eye, it just looks like this is incredible, doesn't it? Uh, perhaps I don't have the untrained eye, so I can't no. say, but yeah, th that I do see that sentiment uh, exactly. And that's an another thing we try to clear up. There's a very big difference between teaching and training and helping a dog cope emotionally and just straight up suppression. Right. And so suppression, uh, you know, in emergency management situations, you do what you have to do. If you have a dog who's lunging and attacking another dog and you have to be aversive to quell that situation, you do that. But it does not count when you're intentionally setting up emergencies and calling it dog training. Um, so, you know, that's that's kind of the message we're trying to get out to the public and help them understand that better so they can make more informed choices. And we're also pursuing licensure and legislation in all 50 states. We're trying to. Now, this comes with its own issues, though. Yeah. Because what do you agree on? 
Like I know we've had the same in the UK and th there's been attempts here in the US, but like what can you agree on? What sort of techniques are are agreeable to most parties in this industry? And what techniques do we say we avoid? What does licensing look like? What does regulation look That's like? Right. It, it, yeah, it's a can of worms, no doubt about it. Uh, what I have recommended, because look, I, I don't come at this as someone who has special knowledge or someone who is uniquely qualified to say how we should license an entire profession. What I would recommend is that any representatives who are interested in pursuing uh, regulation in their field consult with groups like the American College of Veterinary Behaviorists. Um, there is literally every single behavior science uh, institution that I can find of, find in the world does not support aversive methods. Without exception, I cannot find one behavioral science organization, uh, whether that be for humans, animals, dogs, that says, yes, you need to use aversive methods as part of a training or behavior modification plan. So any legislation that would truly represent the public's best interest, we should listen to those uh, whom we have tasked with getting to the bottom of these things as a society. And those are applied animal certified applied animal behaviorists and veterinary behaviorists for a start. That's what I would recommend. Well, then what about Lima? What about... How are we going to get around that? Because a lot of people say, well, if you, you, you it's fine, but if, if you've got mm -hmm. a real issue, then you sort of, you know, you try everything. But if mm -hmm. you have to go there, the least intrusive way, mm -hmm. you know, then that's still acceptable. How do we say what that does? It almost validates the use, the fact that it says you can go there if you want to, if the situation lends itself to going there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So LIMA is an acronym, stands for Least Intrusive, Minimally Aversive. I know you know that, but for those listening, maybe. Um, this was a term coined by a compulsion dog trainer named Stephen Lindsay in the early 2000s. It has been sanitized and updated over the years uh, to become uh, less aversive more and more. Very important stepping stone. I think that was probably a necessary step to advance the field. And in a pre-2021 consensus where we were still a little unclear as to whether or not aversive methods were necessary from time to time in, uh, in rare circumstances, we now know there's no evidence to support the use of aversive methods, uh, fundamentally making Lima, as it's traditionally been interpreted, uh, inconsistent with scientific consens consensus and putting the dog training industry at odds with the most credentialed organizations in the world. And if we're going to go as far as to license dog trainers, I don't want to, I, I don't want to be in a field where my license is inconsistent with the American College of Veterinary Behaviors, for example, among every other organization in the world that is relevant to our field. A hundred percent. I agree with you there, Zach. All right, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, I want to talk shock collars. Are you a dog trainer looking to take your knowledge and skills to the highest level? Or maybe you're a dog guardian interested in figuring out whether your love of dogs can translate into more of a career than a hobby. Or are you already working in the pet industry but recognize that you need to fill some gaps when it comes to how to manage dog behavior so that you can better serve your existing clients? No matter where you are on your journey, the Victoria Stillwell Academy has courses that can help you get to where you want to go. From our free Building Your Dog's Confidence starter course, to the powerful Fundamentals of Dog Training and Behavior course, all the way up to our flagship professional dog trainer course, we have options for every skill level and budget. All you have to do is be passionate about giving dogs the best lives possible. All of our courses are available online anywhere around the world 24-7. No gimmicky sales tactics where you need to act within a certain window to enroll. My amazing team at the Victoria Stillwell Academy understands that we need to be ready to serve you whenever the time is right for you to make the jump. Whether that means dipping your toes into our free courses or realizing your fullest professional dog training dream by enrolling in the dog trainer course. So, Join the thousands of dog geeks like you that are a part of our amazing and supportive VSA family today. We have Academy specialists available to talk with you and figure out how we can help you reach your dog training goals or you can enroll in a starter course for free right now. The Victoria Stillwell Academy. It's the future of dog training. 
I am back with Zach George. And yeah, this is a deep conversation, but it's a conversation that needs to be had. And I, I do want to pivot now to shot collars because this is a thing that both you and I have fought against for a long time. And in recent uh, in recent weeks, there has been a conversation in maybe an attempt to get everybody to the table uh, so for people, people who listen to my podcast, they know that there's two different sides. I mean, that, that's generalizing it, but there's two different sides. There's maybe one of the positive trainers on one side and the balanced trainers slash aversive trainers on the other side. And there was this conversation and an attempt to get like, could there be something, you know, could we agree on some things in dog training? Could you have all these parties meet in the middle and come to some agreement? And while I think that was kind of maybe a, a, a noble desire. I don't think the ends justified the means and that there were certain people that came into this conversation that were under no circumstances going to agree to, uh, to anything and didn't really want to have any idea about how they could perfect themselves or, or, you know, cross the aisle. But, um, during this conversation, there was this well-known trainer who I, you know, I, I know and very much appreciate his work, who was asked the question, should there be, should, should shot collars be regulated or banned? And he upset a lot of people, including myself, by saying that he believed in regulation and that if certain people like said shot collar trainer on the call was using them, he'd be okay with that. But just, you know, almost putting the blame on the general public that it's their use of them is not good and not the device itself. And thereby really, really disappointing a lot of us who follow that particular person. But also I feel really doing a disservice to the positive training community and to dogs themselves. Mm -hmm. then you come in and you say what you think about that. Um, and then in a statement, you were labeled a firebrand. I read the statement. I took issue with that word because the firebrand, if you, if you really look at it, has a lot of different connotations and a lot of them are not good. But you were labeled a firebrand. And what I couldn't get out of my head was why should this man, who is advocating for the welfare and well-being of dogs and has put himself on the line for so long by speaking out against them. Why is this man being attacked and called a firebrand? I took offense to that word, to that. I, I And I looked it up in the English dictionary, dictionary because, you know, I know what it meant in medieval England. I know kind of what it means now, a troublemaker. Um, yeah, you're passionate about your cause, but it's not such a great word. It's quite a negative word. And I, I just, I was so, I was so upset by this that why should somebody who is calling for the welfare of dogs be labeled a firebrand? And then I guess because I'm outspoken too, I'm also a firebrand. That was, that was a lot. And I'm getting very passionate now, but it really, really upset me. What do you say to that? <laughs> yeah, you're, I, and uh, we, we, I mean, your voice carries a lot of weight in the community. A lot of us know that, and we really appreciate you standing up and making that distinction. Because uh, you're right. It's, I often will joke that this is like an episode of The Twilight Zone or, or Black Mirror, where we're living in a world where it is controversial to say, hey, guys, there's no evidence that we need to use pain and fear when we're working with the public's dogs. Can we, uh, can we? agree that at least pain and fear are off the table. And of course, here we are, you know, with the name calling. I mean, that's typically how we, the, the responses will typically be name calling when you try and point that out. You know what I mean? Which is obvious evidence that we're uh, making gains there. But you're right. Yeah, the term firebrand, I mean, it can mean different things to different people. But at the end of the day, you know, why is this a controversy in the dog training field when it is not controversial in the animal behavior community who has been looking at this issue for decades? That was, we, we, well, I wrote a piece, um, actually before that statement came out, I wrote a piece and we posted it online and, and it was about the, that, that it's simple, right? It's simple. Either you're okay using PFA and mm -hmm. fear and pain and intimidation and, or you're not, or purposeful discomfort, which is the phrase I use, or you're not. I mean, it's simple, right? Um, 
But also that I came out also with another statement of like incrementalism in dog training is in, it's important, right? When we are trying to change something, we can't just have it. We can't just click our fingers and that's it. It's done. So things are going to take time. But what this trainer was saying was that, you know, diplomacy was important and being incremental was important. And, you know, you're not going to get everything by breathing fire and all of this. But we've had 20 plus years of this. At least. Yeah. And as I said, the dogs are sitting there going, what are you all doing? Mm -hmm. What are you all doing? Like, w w nothing has changed by just people going, we're just going to be diplomatic. That's right. After the diplomacy, okay, I'm all for diplomacy, but after that, something has got to, somebody's got to flip that switch, don't they? Yeah, yeah. And I, w I would even say that I, I believe in diplomacy, I, which is why when we do talk about this, while we may be firm like yourself, we certainly don't offer personal attacks. We certainly understand the diverse number of dogs and methods out there that can be used all while omitting pain and fear. There are a million ways to train a dog that don't involve pain, pain and fear. So because, you know, often we're accused of being too binary on the issue. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I, I agree with you. It, it, it is a, it is a, um, it is something that has bothered me for a long time, but you know, there is a certain, when you are advocating for dogs and for the better treatment of dogs, I think you have a real responsibility and that's why you have stayed true. You've stayed true to your message and you've stayed true to what you do. And, and I think that definitely, um, that definitely makes people sometimes feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And um, because it's hard when you see that somebody that, you know, you might not agree with is 100% genuine and very articulate and is calling you out and saying, no, no, mm -hmm. this is not the way it's done. Pivoting again, mm -hmm. when you teach people to teach their dogs of course, you're saying that it has to be done, you know, making it fun, welfare and the well-being is really important. But you also, as you can see in your videos, you do a lot of play. You do a lot. You make this a fabulous experience for the dogs that you're working with and therefore the people working with. And you see results. One of the things that people say about positive training is it takes time. Mm -hmm. Can you like qualify that yeah. and go, what, what do, it, does it truly take time and do some things take more time than others? Can you qualify that? Yes. There's often a false dichotomy that using punishment methods is quicker. And I think this is not accurate because it doesn't compare apples to apples. One is focused on suppression. Suppression can give you immediate compliance if you're using a shock collar or a prong collar to, you know, correct something. But that doesn't equate necessarily to a dog learning and understanding the process. Do you see what I'm saying? So those are yeah. often miscompared. Positive reinforcement. This is one of the things in my uh, shade series that's currently ongoing on my YouTube channel right now with Akane Corso that I've uh, that I worked with that we're trying to point out and one of the myths we're trying to dispel that positive reinforcement just takes longer. It would be great if everyone had that time. You know, what really takes longer is when you're using methods that are clearly correlated with increased aggression, fear, anxiety, mistrust, among others. It doesn't count if we're creating other issues that doesn't count as, as being quicker to me or any reasonable person. I don't think. I think you make a, such a great point. Because it doesn't, because you might get that positive reinforcement really quickly when you mm -hmm. see a sudden change of behavior because you just depress that um, that remote control with that shot collar. And it might be so positively reinforcing for you, which gets kind of addictive because you're always seeing these results all the time. You're like, oh, my God, I'm such a great trainer. I think there's a lot of ego in that as well. Mm -hmm. But you are can cause other issues. So that thing that you think you're sorting out so quick is actually causing other issues. And that is a point that I really want to make to people that you don't, if, and I put this on my social media the other day, I was um, sitting with my dog, we're just at the vets and we were waiting to go in. And this woman comes out with this big dog who was everywhere. 
but so full of energy, such a young dog and adolescence and so friendly and so sweet. And she was saying to the nurse, and you probably saw it, she was saying to the nurse, you know, yeah, I just know that I, I, I put it up to three and it didn't work. So I put it up to five and it still is not working. So, and he's just got so much energy. And then I really felt like I had been taken into the twilight zone and was like the matter of fact way that this woman was talking about the fact of using a shot collar on her dog and it wasn't working. So because of her dog's exuberance, she was just going to turn it up and up and up and up. And, and, and that was like, that yeah, that's an example of why not. But she is going to cause so many other problems in this incredibly an amazing adolescent dog that has so much energy. It's going to cause so many other problems. So the future for her is looking very, and for that dog is looking very uncertain. And that's the issue, isn't it? Here, it really is. And she's, you know, from, based on everything you've said, a, a victim. In all of this, you know, she's being she goes online to learn how to use a shock collar. She's being told by the shock collar manufacturers uh, that they're acceptable ex- acceptable to use in a certain way. You can find no shortage of dog trainers from your local community who will be encouraging the use of these devices. It's out of control. The dog training field is in an absolute state of emergency at the professional level. Um, and it's it's certainly an issue. And people like the one you're describing are exactly the reason you and I do this or to make sure they're better informed to make better choices because no one wants to hurt their dog. I don't doubt that woman loves her dog very much. Um, you know, it's we're we're just we trust the experts to guide us. And too often the experts are not experts at all. So when somebody says, all right, Zach, it's all very well, but what are the solutions? It's all very well you saying this, but what are the solutions? What can we do? Solutions are to uh, prioritize the emotional welfare of your dog. If you do that, you're probably going to have a lot less friction in the training process and focus on that individual dog. I know one of my favorite ways to combat the vast majority of, quote, behavior problems that people deal with, like, I mean, things like excessive jumping or exercise early in the day. That's one of the things I often recommend for those energetic dogs. Deplete that battery early uh, after they've recharged all night so they feel more content and more likely to chill out. Uh, playing. You mentioned play. I mean, the language of play to dogs is you can accomplish so much. One of my favorite quotes, and I put it in my book, it's a Plato quote. You can learn more about a person in an hour of play than a year of conversation. And I think that really applies to dogs a lot. If I can get a dog playing with me, I got them right where I want them. Isn't that just the case? Play is so, it's magnificent, actually, what you can do. And that's one of the things that I always say for people who maybe their relationship is is not so great or there's some, start playing with your dog, whatever that looks like. I mean, that might not just be, it might be roughhousing with some, it might be throwing a ball with another, it might be interactive play, it might be passive play, it might be, it. But but at least start that. And, you know, isn't uh, that's why I think the power of positive training is so wonderful because it does rely on play. It relies on having fun. It relies on making dogs feel good. And my God, if they've got some kind of anxiety issue or fear issue, making them feel good and curious. And then we know that, that dogs that are repressed once they start to loosen up they become unstuck they become their world opens up they become so much more curious and curiosity breeds confidence i mean why wouldn't everybody choose that i i for a variety i i agree i think when when you put it that way i think everyone would and that's what we're trying to do it depends on who gets to them first because you'll have your alpha bros out there being like you need to be dominant on this dog they're trying to dominate you by getting on your couch eating first and running out of the door so they just think you're weak you know this is the the standard of advice we often hear from the balanced dog training community and to touch on your point too because i i know a lot of critics uh, may point out, look, these balanced trainers, they use positive reinforcement all the time, you know, but they just sometimes use these corrections. Like, by let, let's give it the best case there. Um, when you resort now to using pain with a dog that you've been, or, or, you know, purposeful discomfort, we can even say, when you resort to that with a dog that you've previously been emphasizing positive reinforcement, you immediately communicate to that dog, actually, you can't trust me quite as much as you thought. Actually, sometimes I will bring pain to you. You immediately fracture that bond that you've been trying so hard to build. In many dogs, 
Now, some dogs are going to be more resilient. I'm not going to say everyone who's ever given their dog a leash correction is abusive. Certainly not members of the public I am not talking to. Our focus is certainly on the professional sector for this you know, current route. Yeah. yeah. Um, three things I'm putting on the spot here. If you wanted dog lovers to know three things, what would they be? Focus on the bond with their dog from a training perspective. That's always that's the first thing in my book that I write about. Focus on play. We've kind of talked about it. Focus on building a relationship with them. I mean, off the top of my head, I guess a lot of those are overlapping. Um, keep your expectations realistic is an important thing. Make sure that you're trying to connect with that dog. People too often prioritize the physical compliance of a dog and are not trained to prioritize the emotional welfare of that dog. And they go hand in hand. It's not like we're doing it because we're so soft, although I'm, I'm a little soft like that. Uh, but it all it actually aligns with the scientific consensus on how to do these things. Coincidentally, if, if people want to know, like, and if people want to know more about you, like what, how would you describe yourself? Right? How would you advocate for yourself? I always like to ask people if you were to, if you were to talk about yourself, what would you say? Like, what do you want to bring to the world? Um, in turn, I, I want people to feel more empowered and liberated to connect with their dogs in ways that are natural to them, that make their life better, that make the dog's life better. And, you know, obviously we're on defense a lot by trying to combat misinformation. And so I really want people to know, because we live in a buyer beware economy here in America, the responsibility does fall on the consumer to do these things and research it, but they don't even know the question to ask yet. So empowering the public to understand this topic better is what I would like to uh, accomplish. So in five years time, <laughs> where do you see the industry? <laughs> That's a great question. That's a great question. It's hard to say whether or not regulation will come um, or licensure will come, a pro, you know, meaningful licensure that adheres to consensus. I mean, I think, you know, we obviously have to clean up our own house in the dog training industry, which is what I'm focused on before, you know, everything else. Uh, the answer is I, I don't know. I don't know if the appetite is there in the public to modernize this field. I don't know if the dog training community is ready to move on. Um, I, I do think we'll be in a better position than we're in today, I hope, but not necessarily. Progress is not a given. It's not a given, but I think with people like you, Zach, I think there will be changes. And I just want to say to everybody out there that don't be afraid to use your voice and to speak up. You don't have to have a platform like Zach or I do in order to be able to make yourself heard. But but I would say also caution with it, because when you do put your head above the parapet, there will be people that don't agree with you and they might do it constructively. And hey, we always embrace constructive criticism and we don't have to have everybody agreeing with us the whole time. But then there are going to be people out there that are either threatened by what you say or want to diminish what you say. And I would just say, just think of the dogs and keep advocating. Do it respectfully. And yes, this is where diplomacy does come in. Try not to go down that rabbit hole. I will hold my hand up because sometimes I have gone down that rabbit hole. But I'm older now. I feel like I'm older and wiser that I should not be doing that anymore. So, but I, I think our dogs need us. They need voices like Zach George. They need your voice. And you know, look what you've achieved in a relatively short time, Zach. I mean, I know that you've been doing this a long, long time too, but still what you've achieved is this, this revolution. And you have been a champion for dogs. You continue to be a champion for dogs. And I just want to say, thank you. Now, if people are like, yes, I want to watch everything you've done. I want, where, where do they go? Where is the best place where they can see everything that you, you're doing? So the majority of my polished dog training content lives on YouTube. Just, you know, you can YouTube me, Zach George. Um, and on Instagram, we're very, we're, we prioritize more social activism over there regarding these issues and related issues. And we post bonus training. So if you want to get to know the real us, go on Instagram. If you're just focused on that dog training stuff, YouTube might be your best bet. 
Perfect. Thank you so much for joining me, Zach George. And I told you I had a great person today. As I do, I have such great guests that come on this podcast, but they are game changers in this industry. And thank you so much, Zach, for joining us. Thank you. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. And keep up the amazing work too. For everybody listening, I hope you take care, take care of your dogs, and I will see you on another podcast. Thanks for tuning in to Victoria Stilwell's Positively Podcast. For Victoria's online dog training courses, more information, and helpful dog training tips, visit Victoria's official website at Positively.com. Get connected on Facebook, Instagram, and other social media as Victoria Stilwell, and follow her on Twitter at Victoria S. Learn to become a professional dog trainer with the Victoria Stilwell Academy at vsdogtrainingacademy.com. And be sure to tune in next time as Victoria helps you and your dog live your best life together, positively. Positively.